Oi, bom dia, pessoal. A gente vai dar início agora à palestra do professor Kevin Leyland. Um, a gente tem a honra né, de contar com essa palestra aqui no Instituto de Psicologia. O professor Kevin Leyland é professor da Escola de Biologia da Universidade de St. Andrews. Ele é um pesquisador de renome, né? Eu diria até um dos mais importantes desta área de é, aprendizagem animal, da interface gene-cultura. É, então, ele vem desenvolvendo um trabalho é, de, bastante relevante dentro dessa área. E nós, então, estamos bastante contentes de poder co contar com a presença dele aqui. Ele vai dar... Então, a palestra, e depois a gente vai abrir um espaço para perguntas. Então, agradeço a presença de vocês, e agora, é o seu talk. Obrigado, Kevin. Obrigado well, muito, Presida, por me convidar. Eu gostaria de agradecer também a Marilla por toda a sua ajuda em me olhar enquanto eu estou aqui em São Paulo. É um grande prazer estar aqui. Ok, então, nós humanos somos uma grande família de coisas muito We humans are a, a pretty remarkable species in, in many respects. We exist at densities that way exceed what would be typical for a, a mammal of our size. We've managed to colonize virtually every region of the terrestrial globe, including some pretty inhospitable regions. And uh, we exhibit extraordinary behavioral diversity in the process in spite of low genetic diversity. We've managed to, at the same time, overcome some really quite extraordinary challenges from uh, splitting the atom to irrigating the desert. I think we all, at least at some uh, intuitive level, have some understanding as to how that's been possible. And it relates in, in no small part to our capacity for culture. And when I use the term culture, I'm not thinking about fine dining or beautiful art or anything like that. I'm thinking in much more general terms about our broad capability to acquire knowledge and skills from other individuals, to express that knowledge in behavior, yes, but also in our tools, our technology, our engineering, and to build on that reservoir of shared knowledge iteratively, fashioning ever more efficient and ever more diverse solutions to life's social and ecological challenges, what we refer to as cumulative culture. And right at the heart of that cultural capability is copying, social learning, imitation, teaching, whatever you want to call it. We humans acquire all kinds of valuable, valuable knowledge from our parents and from other important people in our world. And while we may be unusual with, the, the, with respect to the extent of our reliance on social learning, and also probably with regard to the psychological processes that underpin our social learning, the fact that we copy others is not in and of itself exceptional. Many other animals acquire knowledge and skills from others. They learn things like what to eat, where to find it, how to process it, how to move safely through their environment, what a predator looks like, how to escape that predator, whom to pick a fight with, whom to mate with, and all kinds of other things from other animals. Here are some of the more familiar examples some of you know about. There's the uh, famous case of sweet potato washing and other food processing behaviors that spread through populations of Japanese macaques on the island of Koshima in Japan. There's the uh, equally famous case of the spread of the habit of various species of British birds of pecking open the foil tops of these milk bottles to drink the cream at the top of the bottles. This is a habit that started in the south of England and spread right throughout the British Isles and then into various other countries in Europe. That's the most famous case of uh, uh, tradition and culture in, in other animals, the distinctive tool-using traditions of different populations of chimpanzees throughout Africa. Go to a particular population of chimpanzees, it will have its own distinctive behavioral profile, which it's thought is acquired through little guys like this one, observing the behavior of adults in their population. In this case, learning how to use a stone hammer to crack open nuts. And then there's the traditional use of mating sites, traditional use of schooling sites and resting sites, traditional pathways through the reef that we see in many populations of reef fishes. 
And this is just really just scratching the surface. There are now quite literally thousands of reports of novel behaviors spreading through animal populations in many hundreds of different species of animals. Not just invertebrates, in invertebrates too. We now have, would you believe, evidence for social learning and tradition in bumblebees, in fruit flies, in wood crickets. These kind of observations raise a number of questions. We can ask, what's so good about social learning that it should be so widespread in nature? We can ask, when animals copy, do they just copy at every opportunity, the first individual they see? Or is their copying rule-governed? If it's rule-governed, what are these rules? And perhaps most challenging of all, we can ask, how can we explain the evolution of the extraordinary human capacity for culture out of its roots in something like the behavioral traditions we see in other animals today? How can we go from cracking nuts in the forest to large hadron colliders? or satellites in the sky or putting a man on the moon? And obviously, that's a massive question to address. It's something that I'm struggle I'll struggle to give you an answer to, at least in one hour. But uh, I'll try and give you some semblance of what I think is going on based on something like 25 years of research, developing mathematical models and studying animal social learning, initially at Cambridge and more recently at St. Andrews. And it's an answer that will come in three parts. I'll start by trying to convince you that when animals copy, they don't just copy at every opportunity. They copy highly selectively, highly strategically. That's really by way of background. I'll then move on to the main parts of my talk, where I'll focus in on a competition that I and my colleagues organized to try and work out the best way to learn, the best rule for copying. And I'll describe the findings of a tournament known as the Social Learning Strategies Tournament, which I'd like to think sheds light both on why copying is so widespread in nature and why we humans happen to be so good at it. And I'll end by describing a number of empirical and theoretical projects carried out by myself and other members of my lab over the last uh, couple of decades, which I think are starting to shed light on feedback processes that might have been instrumental in accounting for the evolution of culture in the lineage leading to Homo sapiens. Okay, so let's start with this strategic nature of copying and with the concept of social learning strategies, otherwise known as cultural transmission biases. This is an idea that's actually been derived from two bodies of formal theory, mathematical theory, coming one tradition coming out of population genetics, another coming out of evolutionary game theory, but they converged on the same conclusions. And that is basically that individuals ought to be selective about when, about with, ought to be selective with respect to when they rely on social learning and from whom they learn. And that natural selection ought to have fashioned specific rules, adaptive social learning strategies, as we call them, that dictate the context under which individuals will exploit learned information provided by others. In other words, people have constructed mathematical models to explore when it pays to copy, and they found that you can essentially do better than just copying at every opportunity or just copying at random. But if you copy strategically, according to specific rules, there are fitness dividends for doing so. A number of these rules have been examined. Here are some of the more uh, well-established ones. People organize them in different ways. I like to organize them into simple uh, functional categories. We can talk about when strategies that specify when it pays to copy others. For instance, you could copy when asocial learning is costly. If you're learning about a task through trial and error, it's relatively straightforward, relatively simple, relatively cost-free to acquire that knowledge, fine, you don't copy. If, on the other hand, it's very difficult or costly to acquire that knowledge, you look to others as a source of information. Or there's copy when you're uncertain. You know what you're doing, you're in a familiar context, fine, you don't bother copying. If it's new, you're thrust into a new environment, then you copy others. Or you copy if you're dissatisfied. Happy with your current payoff to your behavior? stick with it. Unhappy, copy others. 
Then there are who strategies, specifying from whom you should acquire knowledge. You could, for instance, copy the behavior of the majority of the population or conform. You could focus in on the behavior of particularly prestigious individuals and adopt their behavior. You could copy the, the individual that's exhibiting the most successful behavior at the time. Or copy individuals in proportion to their payoff. There are actually a very large number of these possible rules that you could deploy. Many of them have been subject to theoretical analysis and have, been, have conferred some degree of formal mathematical support, but is that what animals actually do? Well, these are just some of the animals in which I've studied social learning over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, typically, we won't study animals in their natural environments. We'll bring them into captivity, study them in the, bar, in the laboratory where we can uh, control the conditions to which they're subjected. I like a little bit of experimental control in my analyses. And I think it's fair to say whether we've been working with uh, guppies or rats or chickens, capuchin monkeys, starlings, lemurs, golden lion tamarins, sticklebacks, budgies, chimpanzees, or that most uh, challenging and ferocious of animals, the nursery school child, we've pretty much always found evidence for social learning of one form or another, which is one reason why I think it's widespread in nature and, and functionally important. And more often than not, in fact, I would say far more often than not, the social learning that we see is of this strategic, rule-governed, predictable kind. We can predict it on the basis of the formal mathematical models. Now, I'm just saying this by way of background. I'm not going to present any experimental studies on, on animals to justify that claim. All I'm going to do is present this table, which is from a forthcoming book of mine, where we have four of the better studied strategies. And each of these references here, each of these citations is a separate experimental study providing support for the said social learning strategy. Okay, So you can see you've got experimental support for the idea that you might copy when asocial learning is costly in starlings, in a number of different species of fish and birds and monkeys, in sticklebacks, in minnows, in guppies, calatricids, in humans, a range of different species. Some of these studies are carried out in the laboratory, some in the field, and in a subset of cases, we even have evidence that the implementation of that strategy has been adapted in the sense that it's improved the payoff to those individuals that utilized it. Okay, so that's all by way of background. I hope that's sufficient to convince you that animals don't just copy randomly, that they copy strategically, and that includes humans. Now, this much established, you can imagine that researchers like myself who study animal social learning might wonder, well, does this mean there's a best rule to follow? Is there a best strategy, an optimal strategy to deploy in a changing, complex, variable world? Or perhaps more realistically, do different strategies pay off in different kinds of contexts? And while it's been possible to carry out theoretical analysis, such as population genetic analysis or game theory analysis, where we've been able to compare the relative merits of reliance on two or three or a very small number of strategies simultaneously, there's obviously a limit to how far you can go with that exercise before it becomes intractable. And when you bear in mind that there's actually a kind of infinite universe of possible strategies out there, there's a concern that Perhaps any conclusions you might draw are highly constrained by the strategies that you just happen to conclude. It struck me a few years ago, it would be nice if we had a vehicle, a means of comparing a much larger number of strategies simultaneously, including strategies that had never occurred to us. And it occurred to me that the situation in which we, in the field of social learning cultural evolution, found ourselves was not dissimilar to that faced by this chap, Robert Axelrod, a famous political economist in the 1970s, who famously organized tournaments based around the prisoner's dilemma game, which I'm assuming you'll be familiar with, to study the evolution of cooperation. Okay, so it's a different problem, but he made great headway 
with regard to that problem, the evolution of cooperation, by organizing these open competitions where anybody could submit a strategy about the best way to cooperate. They could, these could be pitted against each other in a computer simulation to see which one out. As you know, tit for tat emerged as the, as the winner. But this is generally regarded one of the most innovative pieces of behavioral research of the 20th century and a real shot in the arm for the field of the evolution of cooperation, which of course has grown enormously since that study. It's now one of the most vibrant areas of research in, uh, in the evolutionary behavioral sciences. So we wondered whether we might be able to make similar headway in the field of social learning and cultural evolution by also organizing a tournament, a competition, based around a game of our own devising, where people could submit their strategies, this time specifying the best way to learn, the best way to utilize social learning. And we could pit them off against each other in a, on a, also on a computer and see which strategies won out. See if we could get some truly general insights into the evolution of culture. Fortunately, I managed to get funding for this idea from the uh, European Union. And that allowed me to recruit Luke Rendell, shown here, who is the postdoc who did uh, most of the work that I'm going to be describing in this part of my talk and did it extremely well. And in discussing this game that we had to devise with, with Luke, it became rapidly clear to us from the outset that if this exercise was going to be successful, it's absolutely critical that we get the game right. And it would be pretty easy to screw up. We could come up with a game that nobody wanted to play or that had some trivial solution, very embarrassing that everybody would kind of hit on and we'd have to kind of give the prize money out to a whole bunch of people. Or that, you know, bore no resemblance to, to biological reality. It has to be a meaningful game to play. So we took the precaution of recruiting a committee of advisors, a committee of experts from the field of social learning and the evolution of culture, as shown here. I don't know to what extent these names will be familiar, but these are big shots. Bob, Rob Boyd, Magnus Enquist, Kimo Erickson, Mark Feldman, they've been studying social learning and cultural evolution for many, many years, and they advised us on the structure of the game. We also got help from Robert Axelrod, Laurel Fogarty, Stefano Gilanda. So this was our kind of team of researchers, and collectively, over something like an 18-month period, we discussed the structure of the game, went through a number of different iterations, and we converged on a game with the following ca characteristics. So it's a multi-arm bandit. I don't know if this is a term which, which means anything to you, but I guess you're all familiar with the idea of a one-arm bandit or a fruit machine, right? You, you pull the lever, and with a certain payoff, you get, um, you get some return, a certain probability you get a return. Well, imagine a, a fruit machine with 100 levers each with its own characteristic payoff. You have to work out which one of these levers is the best to pull. The, the payoffs are actually drawn from an exponential distribution, so that, that means that there are a small number of levers that have very high payoffs, and most of the levers low payoffs. So you have to work out which are the best ones to pull. That's analogous to the game played by agents in our simulated world that we created. You can think of our agents as like little creatures that have been thrust onto a, a tropical island where they have to forage for food. And there are 100 different behaviors they could, forage, they could utilize to gain food. They could, for instance, fish. They could hunt. They could gather fruits. They could grub for insects. They could dig for tubers and so on. Each of these has different payoffs. They have to work out which one of these behaviors to perform. Okay. But it's more complicated than that because the environment changes, changes over time. You might have a good harvest one year, but a poor one the next. So you have to track that change through learning. Then there's evolution in our world through a birth-death process. So individual agents will die at random and will be replaced by the descendants of individuals who accrued high fitness during their life and who inherit the parental strategy. The tournament is organized into a number of different rounds. Each round, each agent must perform one of three possible moves. Okay? So they can firstly innovate. This is learning asocially on their own through trial and error. And this allows them to add a new behavior to their repertoire 
and learn the payoff associated with it without any error. Okay. And it's important that they do learn because individual agents are born naive. They're, and that means they're born without any kind of behavior in their repertoire. So they have to learn to build up a repertoire of behavior and then they can cash in those behaviors and get the payoff. There's another way they can learn though, which is with the move observe. This is social learning. Okay? This allows the individuals to learn the behavior of a number of other agents selected at random from those performing behavior in the previous round. Okay? And here they also learn the payoff, but this time with error. Okay? Now, there can be two kinds of error that they can commit. They can get the wrong behavior, mistake which behavior is being performed. Or they can inaccurately estimate the payoff to any of the behaviors exhibited. And these error terms, together with the number of individuals they observe, the rate at which the environment changes, and a number of other parameters were variables that we manipulated in the tournament. Then there's the third move, which is to exploit, to, to play one of these behavior cards, if you like, to perform a behavior and get the payoff. So these are sort of exploration moves. They acquire new information about behaviors you can perform. This is an exploitation move where you cash in, okay? So when people entered the tournament, they effectively had to contribute a set of rules specifying how the agents under their control would utilize these three moves. What combination of exploitation and exploration they would deploy through these innovate, observe, and exploit moves. The only other major assumption we made was that individual agents possessed memories. They remembered what behaviors they performed and what payoff they received for it. So the tournament was evaluated in, in two phases. There was firstly a round robin phase, as in Axelrod's tournament, where each submitted strategy would uh, have to play every other strategy repeatedly over a number of contests. Each would get the opportunity to invade a population dominated by the other strategy. And then the top 10 performers in that first round, which was carried out over a relatively narrow range of simulation conditions, then went forward to the second phase, which we call the melee, where all 10 strategies competed simultaneously over a far broader range of conditions. And we designated the strategy with the highest average frequency the winner. Okay. We advertised this tournament widely, offering a, a 10,000 euro prize to the, to the winners. So this, I, I'm told this is roughly equivalent to something between 20 and 30,000 Reyes, is that right? Brazilian Reyes? So it's a significant amount of money, and, and we hoped it would be a sufficient inducement to draw lots of people into tackling the problem, having a go from a number of different disciplines. And we're pleased with the response. We got 104 entries, which is significantly more than Axelrod got in either of his tournaments, from 15 different academic disciplines, 16 different countries, no Brazilian entries, sadly, but uh, from 16 different countries around the world. And although one or two of these entries were, were pretty casual, by and large, the majority took this pretty seriously. They, they put a lot of time and effort into their entry. They frequently had kind of set up a, a, a simulation environment of their own devising on their own computer and tried out ideas, played around with things. Often they entered as teams, and they ran little contests amongst themselves to try and work out what would be the best entry to put forward by their team. And uh, we received entries with some really quite complicated code, which was all very gratifying. Okay, so let's get on to the results then. So here we have all 104 entered strategies ranked according to their performance in the first round. So up here, we have the best performing strategies. They won something like 90% of their contests. Down here, we have some of the poorer performing strategies. They didn't win many at all. But you can see there's a nice spread. And that's encouraging for two reasons. First, it means that we haven't obviously screwed up. We haven't got this kind of embarrassing situation where you know, 
everybody's doing really well or everybody's doing really badly. But more importantly, it meant we could go on to do some statistical analysis to say, well, what features of the submitted strategies explain their performance in the tournament? So let me draw attention to some of the things that turn out to be important. The first thing that we learned is, that, at least within the context of our tournament, you can learn too much. There was a strong negative relationship between the proportion of time, the proportion of moves that individual strategies committed to acquiring new behaviors, innovate or observe moves as opposed to exploit, and how well they did in the tournament. The most successful strategies are actually spending a surprisingly small proportion of their time, less than 10% of their time learning, and the rest of their time cashing in. I always think this is a very sobering lesson to those of us who spend our lives in universities. We're essentially spending all of our time learning. We're not going to get on in life. On the other hand, if you must learn, then it turns out the best way to learn is through social learning, through copying. There's a strong positive relationship between the proportion of learning moves that are observed as opposed to innovate and how well an individual strategy does. So the best performing strategies, they're not spending that much time learning, but when they do learn, they're learning through the observed move rather than through the innovate move, through social learning as opposed to asocial learning. Okay? But this seemingly simple relationship belies a degree of complexity that we see if we focus in on some of the top performing strategies and compare them with some of the poorer performing strategies. So here we have the same variables represented. This is the top 10 performing strategies over a broader range of conditions. There's still a positive relationship here. The more they learn through copying as opposed to asocial learning, the better they do in the tournament. It's weaker because we've got lost, less variance, but nonetheless, it's still statistically significant. Copying pays. These are the poorer performing strategies, and there we see a negative relationship. The more they copy, the worse they do. And what this is telling us is that copying only pays if it's done well, if it's done efficiently. And what these poorer performing strategies are doing is they're effectively paying the time cost of learning because every time you learn, every time you acquire knowledge of a new behavior, you're not exploiting a behavior and accruing any kind of fitness. So you're paying a light time cost, so it's crucial that that learning is effective and brings new behavior in your repertoire that you don't already know about and that has higher payoff than the current behavior. And essentially, a lot of the time when these poorer performing strategies are playing the learning card, it's failing. It's failing to bring new behavior into their repertoire with higher payoff than they already have. So how can you learn efficiently then? What can you do that will improve performance? Well, it turns out that the timing of learning is absolutely critical. Successful strategies, which are shown in the top panel here, were able to time bouts of learning to coincide with when the environment changes. So, Payoff is shown in black here. You can see that the strategies are doing very well, and then there's a sudden drop in payoff. That represents the fact that the environment has changed. Behaviors that were reaping dividends no longer are doing so. So what do these strategies do? Well, they engage in a burst of learning. That's shown in red, you see, they're not doing much learning. Then all of a sudden, there's a big spike. They're increasing the amount of learning, bringing new behavior into their repertoire, but then they stop and they start cashing in that behavior by playing the exploit move. So we see in the, these strategies lagged correlations between when the environment changes and when they learn. And that learning is bringing valuable new knowledge into their repertoires. Poorer strategies, on the other hand, are not only spending too much time learning, not enough time exploiting, but they're not timing those bouts of learning optimally to coincide with when the environment changes. And that's one reason why their learning is less successful. We can gain further insights into the efficiency of copying through considering some of the strategies that won out in the tournament that went through into the second phase. So here we have the top 10 performing strategies ranked according to their performance in the second phase, the melee phase of the tournament. 
The winner is called Discount Machine. You can see it's done significantly better than any of the other nine strategies that went through. It was actually the winner in the first round of the tournament too, which is, you know, rather pleasing. There's a nice clean result, no contests. Uh, it's called Discount Machine because, as its name suggests, it discounted information taking account of its age. We place more value on recently acquired knowledge than old knowledge, and it discounted in proportion to the rate of environmental change which it estimated. That's a feature that we see in many of these strategies, actually. The better performing strategies are engaging this temporal discounting. But uniquely amongst the submitted strategies, it also projected forward into the future, carrying out these calculations to work out the probability that investing in further learning at that stage would bring new behavior into its repertoire with higher payoff than the behavior it already possessed, given what it knew about or estimated about the rate at which the environment was changing and the payoff distribution associated with different behaviors. So in other words, it looked back into the past and looked forward into the future. It engaged in a kind of mental time travel to try and enhance the efficiency of its learning. That strategy was submitted by these two guys, Dan Cowden and Tim Lillycrap, two graduate students from uh, Queen's University in Ontario in Canada. Two very, very smart guys, very well-deserving winners. There they are getting their 10,000 euro check. <laughs> and uh, one feature of Discount Machine was that it actually played the observe move relative to the innovate move more than any other strategy. They relied more heavily on social learning and asocial learning than any other strategy that was submitted. Was that responsible for their success? Well, we don't know. I mean, it's, there were many other nice features of that strategy, as we've already seen. So we wanted to know to what extent the success of the winner could be attributed to its reliance on social learning. And Luke came up with the clever idea that we could produce a mutant version of its code. We could take its code and we could change it in one regard. It's identical in every respect except that every time it would have copied, we made it learn asocially instead. We made it innovate instead. That's the only change. And then we reran the entire melee phase of the tournament. And if Switching strategy didn't matter that much. It was all these other features that were important. It should stay as the winner. If, on the other hand, the social learning was important, it should drop down the rankings a little bit. Well, these are the results shown in red. Discount machine came last. So clearly, its success in the tournament was to some degree related to its reliance on social learning. And it struck us that we now had two versions of discount machine identical in every respect, except that one relies heavily on social learning and the other on asocial learning. And this affords a nice opportunity to play them off against each other across a broad range of simulation conditions, it's a rich simulation environment in which to compare the relative merits of learning for yourself against learning socially. And we were very surprised for the results because the copying version of Discount Machine beat the asocial version of it hands down, of an extraordinary broad range of conditions, far broader than any of us had ever imagined. Remember, we had amongst our, our team advisors who've been studying cultural evolution and social learning for many, many decades, including in these, in these analytical systems. So here we have the rate of environmental change, PC. Here we, here we have relatively constant environmental conditions. These are very changeable conditions. A PC value of about 0.5, Take something like that before we start to see asocial learning coming into the picture. PC value of 0.5 represents half of the behaviors changing their, their payoff each round. It's a very, very high rate of environmental change. You could argue that it's not biologically plausible. So for most biologically plausible conditions, copying pays. And this was the real take-home message of the tournament. Copying pays over far broader range of conditions than anybody had hitherto imagined, that the analytical theory that had been carried out to explore these questions would lead us to believe. Just to give you some examples of that, 
There's a wider held view within economics that social learning is, uh, is beneficial because it allows you to home in on high payoff behavior. And that may well be true. But we found we could carry out simulations in our tournament environment where we increase the, the noisiness of the information you get, the information agents get about the payoff to other individuals that they copy. To the point we can actually increase it to the point we just essentially getting no information at all, no useful information at all about what the likely payoff is for that behavior. And even under those circumstances, it paid to copy in the sense that the strategies that won out were heavily reliant on social learning as opposed to asocial learning, on observe as opposed to innovate. Likewise, there's a widely held view within psychology that copying pays because it allows you to sample a large number of individuals very rapidly. We found we could reduce the number of individuals that are copied to just a single individual. So you're essentially getting the same amount of information through social as opposed to asocial learning. And even under those circumstances, it's still paid to copy in the same sense. And many of us in the field of social learning and cultural evolution have thought for, for many years that a big disadvantage to relying on social learning is that you can pick up misinformation, that, you, that through copy error you can acquire bad knowledge. But we found the copy error rates could be astonishingly high. 50, 60, 70 percent of the time, copying could fail. It could fail to bring new behavior into your repertoire, or it could fail to bring in behavior that has higher payoff than you already have. And it's still paid to copy. So why? Why is copying so robust? Well, it turns out that copying pays because other individuals, the copied individuals, filter knowledge, rendering adaptive information available to the copier. So when people enter the tournament, they program the agents under their control to firstly build up a repertoire of behavior and then to perform the behavior in their repertoire associated with the highest payoff. But what that means is when other agents copy them, they're not copying from a random set of behaviors, but from a highly select subset of high payoff behaviors. And that, I put it to you, is why copying pays. That is why copying is so widespread in nature. That's why we see it not just in clever animals like chimpanzees or, or capuchins or, or Japanese macaques, but in fruit flies and in, in wood crickets. It's because you don't actually have to be smart to copy, because a lot of the smart stuff has already been done for you by the individual you're copying. They've filtered their behavior already. If, on the other hand, you are able to copy strategically, the tournament is telling us that there are real fitness benefits to doing that, as we see in the winning strategies of the tournament. To sum up this part of my talk then, copying pays because other individuals filter behavior, rendering adaptive information available to others. There are fitness benefits to copying, provided it's efficient, by which I mean strategic and high fidelity, accurate. And thirdly, successful strategies will time copying for when payoffs drop, They'll evaluate current information based on its age, and they'll judge how valuable it will be in the future. I think these early findings help us to understand why copying is so widespread in nature. This latter finding probably relates more to helping to understand why we humans have to be so good at copying, because I suspect it's probably only in humans and maybe one or two other strategies that we have the, the cognitive capabilities to implement the kind of strategies exhibited by the winning performer in the tournament, the kind of mental time travel that we saw there. OK, so let me move on now to the third part of my talk, where I consider some feedback processes that are likely to be important in the lineage leading to humans. Before I do that, I'm just going to have a little drink of water.
refreshed, I'll continue. So uh, the first study that I, I want to describe that's evocative of these uh, feedback processes is uh, one carried out by Simon Reader, who is a, a graduate student of mine at Cambridge at the time, who's now a professor of, of biology at McGill University in Canada. And what Simon did was, uh, it was really a, a heroic effort on his part. He, he trawled through quite literally thousands of articles, many thousands of articles on primate behavior, collecting reports of behavioral innovation, the invention of new behaviors, and also reports of social learning, allocated them to different primate species, corrected this data for research effort, because obviously some, study, some species of, of primates are studied more than others. Chimpanzees are studied a lot more than tarsiers. We need to take account of the fact that there is this different research effort to the different species. And then plotted the corrected frequencies of social learning and innovation against various different measures of brain size, both absolute and relative brain size. This is the executive brain ratio, which is the uh, neocortex and striatum over, over brainstem. We also had to correct for phylogeny. So this is CAKE independent contrast data. But he found positive relationships between these variables. So whether this is the this is the raw species data, this is the independent contrast data for social learning, for behavioral innovation. There are, there are strong, statistically significant relationships in all cases. In other words, big brain species of primates invent more new behavior and use social learning more than do small brain species of primates. And this led us to endorse an argument that had originally been put forward by Berkeley biochemist Alan Wilson of, of mitochondrial Eve fame, which he called his behavioral drive or cultural drive hypothesis. So this is the idea that uh, in, the, in the struggle to survive and reproduce, individual primates could, could respond to uh, challenges by inventing new behavior or by copying the, the good ideas of other primates. And this would give them an advantage in that struggle. And assuming those capabilities had some basis in neural substrate, then it would generate selection for bigger and bigger brains. There'd be a feedback process. Selecting for bigger and bigger brains, culminating in ourselves, the primate that's most innovative, most reliant on social learning, having the largest brain. Well, our data is certainly consistent with that argument. I think there's something to it. The only thing I would say, the only caveat I'd want to make, is I don't think what we're seeing here is selection for greater and greater amounts of social learning. Because as we've seen, Drosophila can perform social learning. Wood crickets can. Bumblebees can. You don't need a big brain to use social learning. Rather, what I think we're seeing is selection for more and more efficient, more strategic forms of social learning, which only incidentally generate bigger and bigger brains. Let me just spell that out in more detail. So we've, we've seen from the, from the tournament and from also, also from analytical theory that there are fitness payoffs associated with copying efficiently, by which I mean strategically, and with higher fidelity, with greater accuracy. We can imagine that that selection might generate certain structures or, or functional capabilities in the primate brain. You can imagine, for instance, it might generate selection for better perceptual systems, particularly the visual system, to the extent that it allows individuals to copy over far greater distances. Bumblebees might be able to copy, but they can't copy over distances of, of 50 meters. They have to be right up close. Good visual system allows you to copy all kinds of individuals' behavior who might be distant from you. It also allows you to copy the fine motor patterns of other individuals with great precision, as is necessary for imitation. It might also generate selection for cross-modal mapping and integration across modular structures in the brain, or at least the plasticity to uh, integrate across different modular structures. And this would help you to address the correspondence problem, the kind of bugbear of imitation research, which is the fact that the perceptual experience of the demonstrator and the observer in a social learning scenario are very, very different. It might generate selection for 
better comprehension to the extent it allows individuals to understand the goals and the intentions of other individuals, the individual they're copying, and therefore to copy with greater accuracy. It would generate selection for monitoring payoff and frequency dependence to the extent that, that allowed you to implement these rules which analytical theory has shown to be productive, things like payoff-based copying or conforming to the majority behavior. If you can deploy those rules, there are fitness benefits to doing that. It might generate selection for the kind of mental time travel that we see in the winning strategy in the tournament, and also for being sensitive to social cues, uh, social tolerance, which of course afford greater opportunities for copying. So all of these functional and structural capabilities incidentally would lead to bigger brains and would at the same time enhance the efficiency of copy. That's the kind of selective process that I'm suggesting is operating here. Now if this prediction is correct, if this is what is going on, we can, we can, we can make a projection as to what we'd expect to see. We'd expect to see not only that social learning co-varies with brain size, but it should also co-vary with other mental capabilities, other measures of behavioral plasticity in the brain. And that's essentially what Simon Reader found in a follow-up study that we did, where he not only looked at social learning and innovation, but we collated reports of the amount of tool use, the amount of extractive foraging, the amount of tactical deception, breadth of the diets exhibited by these individual primates, and we looked to see to what extent all of these different naturalistic measures of behavioral plasticity co-varied. And we found they co-varied. They co-varied very tightly, in fact. So much so that you can actually carry out a factor analysis or a principal component analysis, and you extract a single dominant factor which explains the bulk of the variance, somewhere between 50 and 80% of the variance in each of these individual measures, depending on how you do it. And you can think of the individual species loadings on that dominant factor as actually a measure of their intelligence, their general intelligence, because we're measuring a whole bunch of different things here, different aspects of their cognition, and we're seeing variants across primates which you can think of as general intelligence. And that argument is supported by the fact that when we plot those species loadings against brain size, we find significant relationships for a number of different brain size measures. We can plot it against performance of these primates in laboratory tests of learning and cognition. There are a number of different meta-analytical data sets that you can utilize for that. We find strong positive relationships between our measure of general intelligence that we compute in this way and how well they do in laboratory tasks of uh, measures of performance. And this is all suggestive of general intelligence. Well, we can plot those, we can also plot those intelligence scores in a phylogenetic package. And that tells us how intelligence has evolved across the primates. Darker colors representing greater amounts of intelligence. And when we do that, we find evidence for convergent selection for general intelligence in four distinct primate lineages. In the capuchins, in the baboons, in the macaques, and in the great apes. Now, it could be coincidence, but I don't think so, that these are exactly the taxa renowned for their social learning and traditions. This is exactly the pattern you'd expect if social learning was driving the evolution of mind, the evolution of cognition. Now, you may be thinking that social learning data has gone into this analysis, so maybe that's a bias. This is an artifact that we repeated the analysis, removing that social learning data, we get the same pattern of results, the same taxa showing evidence of uh, uh, high intelligence. So this is consistent with the argument that social learning has been driving the evolution of intelligence in primates. Another study which has influenced my thinking a lot in this domain is one that I, a theoretical study I carried out in collaboration with Magnus Enquist and Pontus Strimling of Stockholm University in Sweden. The details of the study uh, don't really uh, concern us here, so all, all to do with that. The, the number of different cultural parents and how that forget, affects the fidelity of information transmission. We don't need to worry about that. What I want you to focus in on is this figure and the shape of these functions. So what we have here is the amount of time that a culturally transmitted traits will stick around in a population. It's longevity, if you like. 
plotted against the accuracy with which information passes from demonstrator to observer when social learning takes place, the fidelity of information transmission. We'd expect a, a positive relationship here. That's pretty intuitive. What's interesting is we get an exponential relationship. What that's telling us is as, as group size increases, we get an increasingly steep takeoff in the longevity of a trait relative to fidelity. A small increase in the fidelity of information transmission, the accuracy with which information passes from demonstrator to observer, therefore can make a very big difference to firstly how long a cultural trait will remain in the population, and as a knock-on consequence of that, how much culture, how many different cultural traits you will find in a given population. I think this goes a long way to explaining why we might see in, in chimpanzees, obviously our closest relatives, 39 reported cultural behaviors, whereas how many have we got in the humans? In the millions, in the billions, too many to count. That probably reflects in part the fact that we have higher fidelity information transmission. We have teaching, we have language, we have more accurate imitation. We've, in other words, been shifted in this dimension, which leads to our cultural traits sticking around for much longer, hence we have a lot more cultural traits. In contrast, many other animals, the fishes and other rodents that I study, they might have some social learning and behavioral traditions occasionally, but these traditions typically don't stick around for very long. That's probably reflecting the fact that they're reliant on low fidelity mechanisms such as local enhancement. And it's easy to imagine if you don't have high fidelity information transmission, you don't have the traits sticking around for long, then there's not much opportunity to refine or improve those behaviors. If, on the other hand, the traits are in the population for a long period of time, there's the opportunity to produce refinements, improvements, recombinations of cultural elements so you can get cumulative culture off the ground. And that's a conclusion that is supported strongly by an analysis carried out by another postdoc of mine, Hannah Lewis. She's another theoretician. What Hannah did, she imagined a population of uh, agents, if you like, who were seeded with a number of different cultural traits, hypothetical cultural traits, each with its own characteristic utility or functionality. And then there are four kinds of events that could happen to that population. Firstly, they can invent another cultural trait, a new trait. Secondly, they could refine or improve an existing trait, produce a new version of it that was slightly better, higher utility. Thirdly, they could combine different cultural elements to produce a new trait again, a recombination, like you might take a, a, a sharp edge and a... And a um, stick and combine them to make a spear. And then fourthly, there could be a loss of a cultural trait. Okay? So those four events could occur with fixed probabilities. We went on to see well, what combination of these different events generates cumulative culture as measured by, in this case, the average number of traits in the population, the average number of lineage years, the average trait complexity, the number of different elements making up a trait, the number of lineage complexity, and the utility of the traits. Different measures of cumulative culture, if you like. We allow a number of these events to happen, thousands of these events. Which combination of different parameters will generate the most cumulative culture? And she found that one of those variables dominated the proceedings, and that's the rate of trait loss, which is actually the inverse of fidelity, if you think about it. If you have very accurate information transmission, there's a low rate of loss of the behavior. On the other hand, if you've got inaccurate information transmission, it's lost rapidly. That dominates the proceedings. The rate of trait loss explains more variance in cumulative culture than novel invention, trait modification, or trait combination combined. If you've got very accurate information transmission, low rates of loss, then even very modest 
amounts of recombination or refinement can lead to massive cumulative culture very rapidly. But on the other hand, if you don't have a threshold level of fidelity, you simply cannot get cumulative culture off the ground. It doesn't matter how much refinement you've got going on, how much novel invention you've got going, you simply cannot get cumulative culture off the ground. I think that's why we humans seemingly uniquely have cumulative culture because we have that high fidelity information transmission mechanism. How do we get it? Well, one thing I think that's important is teaching. So we humans teach, and we teach so pretty widely. For a long time it was thought that other animals did not teach. Perhaps I should explain. By teaching I'm talking about actively investing in the learning of other individuals. Animals will frequently copy each other, but the copied individual is just typically going about its own business. It's not investing in the learning of other individuals. But recently there have been a spate of reports of teaching in other animals, but perhaps not in the species you might anticipate. Not in chimpanzees, not in Japanese macaques, not in capuchins, not in gorillas or dolphins, not in these famous cerebral, large-brained mammals, but in ants, in bees, in meerkats, in pied babblers. So why? How can we make sense of this seemingly bizarre taxonomic distribution for teaching? Well, I asked my uh, graduate student, former graduate student Laurel Fogarty and postdoc Pontus Strimling to develop a mathematical model to address this question. When does it pay to teach? They came up with a model in which a valuable skill or piece of information could be acquired through three separate means. Through asocial learning, trial and error if you like, through inadvertent social learning, regular copying, or through being taught, through being taught through from a cultural role model who is a, a close relative. So this figure I think is quite instructive. So what we have here on this y-axis is the fitness difference between a teaching genotype and a non-teaching genotype. So where these colored lines are above this dashed line, teaching is invading the population. It's favored by natural selection. It will go to fixation. And what we have on this x-axis is the probability of acquiring the would-be taught information through other means, through asocial learning or through inadvertent social learning. And as you see, we get these N-shaped curves. What's going on? Well, at this end of the spectrum, we have very easy to acquire knowledge. This is, these are behaviors that could easily be learned through trial and error, or through inadvertent social learning, through just regular copying. That doesn't favor teaching. Why? Well, actually, with the benefit of hindsight, it makes intuitive sense. There's no point in investing in a costly behavior that will make it more likely that your relatives will acquire a behavior that they're likely to acquire anyway. Teaching doesn't pay. But on the other hand, that's still instructive because it helps us to understand this seemingly bizarre distribution associated with teaching because chimpanzees, capuchins, macaques, and so on, they're smart animals that are good at asocial learning. They're good at social learning, regular inadvertent social learning. And that actually makes it harder for teaching to be favored. It raises the bar, making it more difficult for teaching to pay. At the other end of the spectrum, we have very difficult to learn traits, the traits that are unlikely to be acquired through asocial learning or inadvertent social learning. And they seemingly don't favor teaching either, but for a different reason. There, the information is rarely present in the population at sufficiently high frequency to be available to the tutors to pass on to their pupils. And there's no point in investing in the, in the kind of cognitive machinery, the infrastructure to teach if you haven't got any good knowledge to pass on. So you end up with a window of tasks of intermediate difficulty that potentially support teaching, with the breadth of that window a function of the fitness advantage of the behavior. It's a very advantageous behavior, but a 
have a broader window than if it's a not so advantageous behavior. But it turns out that fitness advantage really has to be quite significant for teaching to pay, which is why I think that teaching is comparatively rare in nature. Okay, so you might be wondering, what's going on with humans? How come we can teach so wide? We teach over such a broad range of conditions. How do we kind of beat the system? We also teach stuff which is really quite hard. I mean, I was taught how to do calculus, for instance. Well, one thing that we humans have is cumulative culture. It comes back to that. What does cumulative culture do? Well, it makes available in a population knowledge that's really very complex, that's built up over time as each refinement has improved the existing knowledge. But it's available in the population for tutors to pass on to their pupils. I couldn't, for instance, invent the computer on which I'm presenting my talk. But I could be taught how to build one, probably, and I could pass that knowledge on to somebody else. So this led to the idea that perhaps teaching and cumulative culture might have co-evolved. So we explored that idea by developing a refinement of our model, where if you had acquired the first piece of information, you could go on to acquire a second piece of information made it more difficult to learn, but which had higher payoff associated with it. And we found, sure enough, that this cumulative culture broadened the range of conditions under which teaching paid, and did so precisely for the reason that we anticipated. It's hard to see, but it made information, this is the amount of information, available at higher frequency in the population. It's available to the tutors to pass on to their pupils. So effectively distorting these curves so that hard stuff can support teaching. So cumulative culture broadens the range of conditions under which it pays to teach. And that link between high fidelity information transmission and cumulative cultural learning is supported in this experimental study, which is the last study I'm going to present today. So a study carried out by Lewis Dean, a graduate student of mine, and a former student, Rachel Kendall. What they did was they devised a cumulative, uh, cumulative culture puzzle box. So this is a, a, a foraging box, if you like, which can be solved at three different levels, yielding ever more desirable returns, rewards, if you like. So in the case of the animals, it's foods. In the case of the children, we did this with the, the rewards are stickers. So we presented this puzzle box to small groups of nursery school children, aged three to five, capuchin, uh, sorry, chimpanzees and capuchin monkeys. The idea was not so much to see whether the chimpanzees and the capuchins were capable of cumulative culture. We kind of suspected they probably wouldn't be able to solve the task at the highest level, but more to try and work out why. There are a number of hypotheses in the literature that accounted for this difference the presence of cumulative culture in humans, not in other animals. Is it to do with our cognitive abilities? Is it difference, differences in our social structure? What was it? We wanted to sort between a number of different hypotheses. So this slide shows you the results. It's a slightly complicated one, but uh, I'll talk you through it. So what we have in this first panel here is the performance at the task, which level individuals got to. Let's start with the chimpanzees that's shown in red. What we found was that only one individual, one individual chimpanzee out of something like uh, 74 chimpanzees that we studied was able to solve this task at the highest level. And when she performed this behavior, it didn't spread to other chimpanzees. Okay? They performed the task, they solved the task at the lower level, but not at the second level. Only four of them solved it at the second level, only one at the highest level not multiple individuals within the population solving it. So no evidence for cumulative culture in the chimpanzees. The performance wasn't enhanced by having trained, demonstrated chimpanzees repeatedly performing this task at the highest level. No evidence for cumulative culture. Similarly, amongst the capuchins, I'm sorry to have to tell you. We, we didn't see evidence for, for cumulative culture there either. Solving it at the lowest level, not at the higher levels. One individual got to the highest level. One smart female. 
That stands in stark, uh, in stark contrast to the children, where we have eight groups of children, and the majority, we get a majority of the children solving the task at the highest level, despite having far shorter exposure to the task, too. How do we explain that difference in performance? Well, one thing that seems to be important is teaching. The children would teach each other to solve the task. We see a lot of teaching amongst the children. They're doing things like, open that door there, push that button there, turn that knob there. They're helping each other voluntarily. No evidence for any teaching in the other two species. That teaching is dominated by verbal instruction. Okay? And the verbal instruction that a child receives improves its performance. Those that got verbal tips from other chimpanzees do better than those that don't. The other two species, we see communication, but it doesn't seem to improve performance. We did wonder, for instance, whether there might be food calling, recruiting other individuals to the task and improving their performance. No sign of any enhancement of performance associated with the food calling. We did wonder whether there might be more simple forms of scaffolding going on. The individuals might engage in a certain amount of tolerated theft that maybe their mothers would help their offspring to learn by allowing them to steal the food that they themselves have retrieved. Not a bit of it. The mothers are stealing the food from their babies. We looked to see whether there was any matching behavior going on, whether when one individual observes another individual at the, at the food box and then that other individual disperses and they get the opportunity to int interact with the task, whether they would perform the same behavior that they perceive, whether they manipulate the object in the same way. Well, we see high levels of matching amongst the children. More matching than non-matching, only in the children. Whereas in the other two species, there's more non-matching than matching, and there's more matching in the children compared with the other two species. Matching is, is consistent with both imitation or em emulation. Some form of observational learning is taking place to a greater degree in the children than the other two species. And we see, quite literally, hundreds of cases of, of prosociality in the children. Okay? These children are spontaneously giving these highly desired rewards that they retrieve, these stickers. The kids love their stickers, but they're spontaneously giving them to other children, okay? which we interpret as them understanding that the other children share their goals and share their intentions. Not one single incidence of prosociality in either of the other two species. We can't explain the poor performance of the capuchins and the chimpanzees because of scrounging, blocking their learning, because of dominant individuals monopolizing the, the food box, because of uh, a lack of attention to the individuals manipulating the task, because of individuals satisfying these that aren't consistent with the predictions. Rather, it seems to be these cognitive differences that underlie the difference we see in the overall performance. And that is really brought home by the fact that we find strong positive correlations between how much teaching an individual child receives, how much verbal instruction they get, how much imitation or other forms of matching they engage in, how much prosociality they benefit with, benefit from, and how well they do in the task. It seems like this ability to solve this task, this cumulative culture task, is related to a package of socio-cognitive capabilities that includes teaching, that includes imitation, that includes verbal instruction, and prosociality, and links high fidelity information transmission to cumulative culture. In summary, then, I've argued that animals, including humans, copy strategically, not randomly. But doing so is adaptive. That there are fitness benefits associated with strategic high fidelity copying we saw from the tournament. We've seen a positive relationship among primates between the amount of copying they exhibit and brain size, which I think reflects selection for efficient copying, which may be driving brain evolution and the evolution of cognition. We've seen that small increases in the fidelity of social transmission lead to big increases in the amount and the longevity of culture, and that high fidelity information transmission is necessary for cumulative culture to get off the ground. And finally, teaching, which enhances the fidelity of information transmission, 
may have co-evolved with cumulative culture because each seems to reinforce the other. Well, that's it. I'd just like to thank my many, many collaborators, too many to, to, to name, my funders, and you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. We also thank you very much for your wonderful talk. And now we open for questions. And uh, if you want to make the question in Portuguese, we may translate for you. If you prefer to talk in English, then you can do it. Thank you. Yeah, so um, these are a, a, a very small species of ants that live in, in, in very small colonies, uh, just a few hundred individuals, um, that typically uh, many ants, there are obviously many thousands of species of ants, they communicate information about the, about the location of food sources by leaving odor trails, scent trails, and other ants can follow those. And a sufficient number of worker ants to keep those trails active. But these are small colonies, and those, those uh, scent trails just dissipate too rapidly, they're too volatile to, to, to work. So they need another mechanism. What they have is, is called tandem running. So uh, if, a, if a worker ant would discover a food source, it comes back to the nest, and then it walks very slowly towards, back towards the food source with another ant behind it. And they sort of follow each other. If the, if the following ant gets lost behind, it waits, it stops for it. And then when, the, when they've got contact again, it sets off again. And it leads it to the food source. And it takes quite a long time to do this. It takes uh, something like three times the time it would take if they just went on their own. But they'll lead it to the food source. And the advantage of leading it there is that the follower then knows the location. It knows how to get there. There's a quick way of taking it there, which is just lift up the ant and carry it. And they'll do that too. But what they do is they, they first of all will lead a whole bunch of ants to the food source. And then when they've got a critical number, sufficient, sufficient individuals in the, in the population who know where to go, they'll just carry the others there. And then they can, they can just bring the, the food back themselves. So this satisfies uh, definitions of teaching because it's a costly behavior. There's a time cost associated with leading other individuals to the food source. They've invested in the learning on the part of the, uh, of the other individual. Clearly is leading to learning because they, they learn the route to the food source. And that learning is linked to the teaching. So those are the three criteria that you need to, to claim teaching in any functional sense amongst animals. So that's the ants. The, the meerkats are, are very cute. So what, what you have are these uh, meerkats Pups acquiring um, knowledge about a whole bunch of different food sources. Some of these are quite dangerous. One of them is a scorpion, which has a very uh, potent sting, which could actually kill a, a, a meerkat if it were stung. So what the adults will do when they're, when they're proficient at hunting scorpions, they'll catch them, they'll rapidly kill them, they'll bite off the sting, and then they'll eat them, swallow them whole. But, but this, is, this would be a, a classic case of copy where asocial learning is difficult because, you know, there's a big cost associated with learning through trial and error how to, how to catch a scorpion. It's not an easy thing to do. You try it. It's not an easy thing to do at all. Um, and moreover, if you're watching other individuals, what you see is another individual dash into the bushes, do a bit of scrabbling around, and then come out with a scorpion, you know, and swallow it. It's, it all happens very, very quickly. So it's even quite difficult to learn through social learning. So this is the kind of condition where teaching might be favored. Again, it's a, a relatively costly behavior to teach. So what happens is that the, the uh, helpers at the nest, they're a cooperative breeding species, so they'll have a whole bunch of other adults that are helping uh, rear the pups. And they'll go and they'll catch the scorpions. And they'll bring them back to the pups. 
And it's quite interesting. They, they deliver the, pup, the, the, the prey in different forms depending on the age of the pup. So when they're very, very young, they'll kill the scorpion, they'll bite off its sting, and they'll deliver it to the pups in that form. When the pups are a little bit older, they'll disable the scorpion, they'll bite off its sting, give it to the pups. When the pups are a little bit older than that, well, they'll leave the scorpion fully intact, but with the sting bitten off. And then finally, when they're really old, they'll give them the fully intact scorpion with its sting. So they're kind of shaping the learning of the pups depending on their age in a kind of appropriate manner. This is potentially costly for them because they're, firstly, they're not going to eat this food, um, the pups are. And secondly, a lot of the time, the, the scorpion escapes because the pups are very incompetent. So they often then have to go and retrieve it again or it's lost completely. That's a cost associated with it. Experiments, nice experiments, carried out by uh, Alex Thornton at Cambridge. Uh, has established that this, that, that this leads to learning on the part of the, of, of, of the pups and that their learning is linked to that coaching behavior. So those, those are the kind of teaching that, that we're seeing in these other species. Any other questions? Yeah, so I think there has been um, um, a lot of interesting developments in, in the last few years about the, the role of what you can think of as a kind of cultural drift process where uh, uh, demography turns out to be a very important pa pattern. So you can see uh, people used to talk about the, the Upper Paleolithic Revolution where all of a sudden in, in, in Western Europe we see suddenly much more complex culture associated with uh, ancestral populations. Uh, we don't use that term very much anymore. And uh, um, that in part reflects the fact that going back uh, 60, 70, 80,000, 100,000, even a few hundred thousand years, we're seeing some quite complex tools, tools that historically have been associated with, with uh, modern people only in Europe. And uh, so you have, you know, pointers and scrapers and, and uh, throwing sticks and all kinds of complicated uh, technology. But what's interesting is that these, these technologies will often appear in certain regions in Africa but then disappear again. And uh, so there's been a, 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 a number of arguments put forward and some, some analytical and simulation analyses to say, well, to what extent could this be explained by demographic features, by the, by the presence of larger populations and then for whatever reason we see a, 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 a smaller populations or at least smaller networks, um, networks become disassociated because of physical barriers. If people lose contact with each other, then technology could be lost. And the, th and, and the theoretical work that's been done supports that argument. It's, it's plausible that cultural traits could be lost through drift-like processes, and this could explain some of the variation that we're seeing. And actually, in one of the figures that uh, I showed you, we, we, actually, we actually get a finding which is quite consistent with that argument. Um, so... If I show you this figure again, you're seeing that population size is very important here. Okay? As you get increasingly large populations, you're supporting more and more cultural traits. So that's definitely a part of the story. We also found that with this second analysis that we carried out here. It's a function of population size. It's easier to get cumulative culture building up in a large population than a, a small population. So size 
population size, demography, it's definitely a part of the story. But on the other hand, I don't think it's the whole story. Okay? I don't think drift is the complete explanation. You need to have high fidelity information transmission as well. You could have the appropriate demography as we see in many other species of animals, but you're not getting rich culture. You need that high fidelity information linked to those cultural transmission processes, the right kind of demography, the right kind of population size to get cumulative culture off the ground. You mean globally? Uh, so I'd be the first to admit that the uh, measures of brain size that we've looked at are relatively crude. This is a, this is a very crude assay of, of the computational power of the brain. I think it's defensible because you have to start somewhere. But we, we might want to go on to look at um, the relationship between these different various measures like you know our generalistic general measure of intelligence but also innovation social learning relationship between these measures of behavioral plasticity if you like and individual structures in the brain uh, and we might well find uh, more detailed uh, functional relationships between these different structures and we we also might not want to think in terms of the bulk of a tissue, but the, but the concentration of cells, because obviously some tissues have higher concentrations of cells than others. So yes, these are the kind of analysis. Actually, we've got a study which is ongoing, uh, which is, which is um, scanning more brains, uh, because the brain data bank that we rely on, in fact, everybody is reliant on, is, is, is very heavily dependent on uh, a study carried out by a very systematic German called Stefan, who, uh, who, who uh, did these brain slicing uh, studies, measuring different structures in, in the brain for a number of different primates. Um, but it's, you know, it's not great data, by and large. Um, now, with the advent of new technology, we can scan those brains. Uh, we need to build up a better database. As it currently stands, often we only have a single brain for a species, and we need, obviously need to multiple brains and different ones for males and females and know something about the history of that animal, its weight and so on. Um, so gradually this, this kind of data is improving. We're, we've got a study now which is scanning a lot of brains um, and recording that kind of data and so we can improve the robustness of it and when we've done these scans we can look at uh, cell counts as well at the same time and look at individual structures within the brain. So, you know, I take your point, watch this space, maybe within a few years we'll be will be publishing that kind of uh, analysis. Yeah. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting uh, area. I mean, I, I kind of think of these, as, uh, think of these as, as, as very related ideas. The idea of social learning strategies is stimulated by, by uh, in part, by a classic, classic article by Dori Fragazzi, who will be very familiar to you, on, on uh, directed social learning in, in, in primates. And clearly, when, when other animals are copying each other, um, there does seem to be some directedness to information flow. It's not just going at random, it's following particular pathways of information flow through social networks. So one of the studies that we're currently uh, undertaking is to map the social network within animal populations, or indeed there might be multiple networks associated with different patterns of behavior, and exploring to what extent information flow follows those social networks, what's known as network-based diffusion analysis. You'd expect animals that spend a lot of time together to learn from each other, but is that what is happening? It, it may not be. Uh, it could be that you, you, you spend time with those individuals, but you're happy to, happy to learn from an individual that you, you don't spend time from. 
So it's not inevitable that, that will be the case. Um, so again, this is, this is the kind of study that we're, that we're um, carrying out currently. We've, we've done some work on uh, populations, captive populations of birds in, in, in zebra finches, in budgerigars, in, in, in starlings, looking, mapping their, their, their social networks and looking to say when novel behavior spreads to the population, does it follow these, these pathways of, of social influence as you would expect? And it doesn't actually always do that. Um, a, a, another sort of interesting feature of this is the kind of statistical models that we're applying to ask how information flows through populations to allow us to say whether when the behavior spreads, it's spreading through social learning or asocial learning. Because everybody hitherto had assumed when we see a novel behavior spread through a population, they're probably learning from each other. It kind of makes sense. It looks like that. They're often attending to each other. It looks like they're copying each other. Well, if they are copying from each other, we'd expect evidence, statistical evidence, that information flow follows the social network, follows the opportunity to learn socially. And actually, we're finding that sometimes it doesn't. So, for instance, we carried out a recent study with, with sticklebacks, where we're getting these beautiful diffusions, very evocative of social learning, but actually, all their learning seems to be asocial. So, uh, we're seeing an association between between social learning strategies and uh, in, in, in directed social learning, that, that's for sure. We're seeing, in some instances, information flow following social networks, but it's also telling us something about the learning processes that are involved. And one of the projects that I have for the, for the next few years will be to extend these statistical methods so that they're better able to identify the social learning strategies that animals are deployed, deploying in naturalistic contexts. We see a diffusion, we see behavior spreading through populations, it might be a group of capuchins, for instance, your, your nutcracking behavior on, on your island population of, of capuchins, and, and then we can do a statistical analysis with good diffusion data and say well, what the social learning mechanism was in, that was deployed. We're also, uh, and this is a kind of related idea, uh, developing statistical methods to say, well, what was the psychological process that underlied their social learning? To what extent are they reliant on imitation or emulation or local enhancement? Different mechanisms, will, we would think, lead to different patterns of diffusion. So potentially with good quality data, you can say something about the mechanisms involved. So all of these, I think, are interesting uh, and exciting developments that will allow us to say something a little bit more about the information um, that's being utilized and the, and the underlying psychological processes that are operational when novel behavior spreads through animal populations. So how do we explain the diversity that we're seeing across uh, across? Yeah, the thing we can yeah, so I mean, I think what this study is is doing is focused specifically on cumulative culture. Uh, so, so in a way, it doesn't really have that much to say about the capuchins, except that they they are likely to be uh, at this relative, relatively towards this end of the spectrum. Actually, it's, it's probably better to look on this slide. Capuchins and, 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 and chimpanzees are kind of interesting cases because I I think they're sort of intermediate between what we're seeing in many, many other species where we have social learning, we have traditions even, but they're often referred to as lightning traditions. Um, now, I don't know wh whether much has been done on the archaeology of capuchin um, uh, traditions. I, I know that uh, Elisabetta had a study on um, archaeology for, for capuchins and primates, other primates. Maybe you were involved in that. but. Uh, um, some data is, is suggestive 
of certainly chimpanzees having traditions that persist for quite long periods of time. And actually, you have Darwin talking about, um, in, in, in The Descent of Man, talking about the stone-using stone traditions of different chimpanzees. Curiously, primatologists seem to have forgotten about that, and then it was reinvented by, <laughs> by Jane Goodall in, in, in the 1970s. Um, but that at least shows that this is a behavior that's been going on for hundreds of years. And I think there's archaeological evidence for chimpanzees suggestive that it might be thousands of years. Um, and it's not inconceivable that even the common ancestor of, of, of chimpanzees and humans might have been, might have been cracking open nuts uh, you know, a few million years ago. Uh, in which case we have very long-standing traditions uh, associated with these animals. And perhaps there's something like that going on with capuchins too. So these are our species that are kind of intermediate. They have a higher degree of, I would su suggest, a higher degree of fidelity of information transmission, retaining uh, behavior in the population for longer periods of time. I don't know to what extent there's... Um, um, evidence for imitation, probably not so good evidence for imitation in the capuchins, but we do have evidence for some degree of imitation in, in chimpanzees. So that's with regard to cumulative culture. When it comes to explaining the, the diversity of um, capuchin and chimpanzee culture, I think probably it's, again, related to the fidelity of information transmission. We're getting multiple traditions in these species because they have a higher fidelity of information transmission than we're seeing in other primates. That would be my working hypothesis. Not that necessarily we have strong evidence that, that in, the, in, in the wild they're using imitation to a higher degree than other species, but, but we haven't got data on that yet. Um, there's been, there's been a, 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 a widely held view for a long time that imitation, possibly emulation, but one or two other forms of observational learning uh, are more accurate forms of social learning. They have higher fidelity associated with them than local enhancement and these perhaps simpler processes of social learning. Makes a lot of sense, but there's not a single modicum of data to support that. Okay, so we need data, uh, and in fact, this is another project that I have uh, to try and apply the statistical models that we have that can identify social learning mechanisms in a, in a natural context. Once we've identified the mechanism, we can, we can quantify the fidelity of information transmission in those cases, and we can start to say, well, is it the case then? Firstly, is it the case that they are copying with higher fidelity, and which mechanisms support high fidelity information transmission? Hopefully, we'll get a nice story and we'll see higher fidelity information transmission in the, in the capuchin. Modularity? Modularity. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, are, you, are you thinking particularly with respect to humans or in, in, in non-human primates? Well, let's deal with non-human primates first. So, um, well, actually, I, w I'll, I'll, I won't go and find a, a slide. So, uh, one of the questions that we wanted to address with our follow-up study that Simon Reed had carried out, tool use, extractive foraging, all these different measures of cognitive uh, ability in, in non-human primates is to what extent these capabilities um, are utilized independently of each other, so supportive of a, of a modular structure, 
and to what extent they co-vary in their utilization within a given species, and whether when we look at the evolution of these capabilities, they evolve together or separately. Well, the analysis that we carried out strongly supports the view that these capabilities co-evolved. They, they evolved together, um, and that they are utilized to a greater or lesser extent by different species, but they tend to occur in patterns together. So it's supportive of this uh, general intelligence idea. It's slightly different from general intelligence that we generally talk about in humans, because there you've got variation within a single species. Here we're talking about variation across different species. And maybe that some people would say we shouldn't use the term general intelligence, because it's a different concept to the way it's generally referred to in humans. Um, but nonetheless, when we're looking at non-human primates, we don't see evidence for modularity as such in, in, in their utilization of different um, cognitive capabilities. But I, but I emphasize the fact we haven't looked at variation within a given species, okay? So then there's humans, um, where I haven't looked at brain structure of humans at all. Uh, but I do uh, obviously have some views about the degree of modularity. I mean, this is, this is something that has received a lot of attention over the years, uh, particularly in uh, the um, behavioral evolutionary sciences where uh, evolutionary psychologists of the uh, Cosmides and Tubis uh, tradition, the Santa Barbara School, have argued for a, a modular structure to the human mind. They've argued that uh, general capabilities could not have evolved. I would take issue with those claims. I think that uh, when it comes to the evolution of cognition, we'd expect a certain amount of, uh, uh, of specialization, a certain amount of generalization. Um, and um, th that, in essence, is what you see. You can't, you, 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 you obviously, have some modular structures in, in the brain. brain. Take, say, perceptual systems, they're highly modular. You've got different sort of functional input systems to the brain, uh, which are functionally organized, which are very, uh, very constrained. But on the other hand, when it comes to information flow between those different input systems, we've got high levels of integration. When it comes to the cognition, um, the, the different various computational aspects of the tasks we might see in humans often will rely on uh, information from multiple streams. They'll integrate in different ways. They'll use algorithms such as learning algorithms, Bayesian algorithms that are being used to, to understand these, the, the operation of these systems that are very general, being applied across different domains. And the kind of uh, processes that I've talked about, social learning strategies, for instance, are a good example there. If you're thinking about um, say one of the most studied social learning strategies is the tendency to conform, to adopt the majority behavior in the population. It's a very adaptive rule, highly adaptive rule. There have been mathematical models exploring the circumstances under which it pays to acquire knowledge in that way, and it, and it, and it pays to conform to the majority behavior across a very broad range of uh, simulation conditions. But of course, you can conform with respect to what clothes you wear, what food you eat, what kind of individual you find attractive in the opposite sex, all kinds of different, what have traditionally been viewed of as distinctive, functionally separate domains by evolutionary psychologists in that tradition. This is an example of a general rule which has been applied widely across these domains. And I think that's pretty representative of what's, what's going on more broadly in the brain. We've got some pretty general rules that are being applied across different de domains. In other words, the degree of functional modularization um, within the human brain has been probably exaggerated by uh, evolutionary, that, that particular evolutionary psychology tradition. I should emphasize the fact that um, there are many evolutionary-minded psychologists who don't necessarily adhere to that nativistic, modular school of thought um, and who haven't sort of bought up to that degree of uh, what, what philosophers have referred to as massive modularity in the, in the brain. Um, so uh, uh, that's a very long-winded answer to, to your, your question, but I think that 
uh, probably there's less modularity than many people think. So I think, um, I thank you very much. Um, I also, eu também vou agradecer aqui o departamento, o Instituto de Psicologia, que tornou tudo possível, o Murilo, que deu um grande apoio aí na vinda do professor Kevin. E eu estou aqui com os certificados, então depois acho que a gente entrega para vocês. E queria agradecer de novo. Obrigada. Thank you very much.